I was struck by several things that have nothing to do directly with what I had prepared. And I feel like I need to just share, you know, um, Roman, you mentioned Jesus was seen by Cephas. And then we, we had in the, the reading uh, from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus saying, touch me, feel me. These were eyewitnesses giving testimony to what they had actually seen. Our faith is not based on some mystery that's been revealed to us from people who were there. Maybe this is why I needed to talk about my friend David. David's blind, alcoholic, street person. And on Friday night this week, he called me on the telephone seven times between 2.45 and 5.30 in the morning. Twice on my home phone, five times on my cell phone, which I can't turn off because I'm on call at night watch and I have to respond to emergencies, so I can't just turn the ringer off. So seven times in the middle of the night, I got up and looked at my phone. I thought, okay, I answered it. He hung up seven times. This has happened in the past, uh, and sometimes I'll answer it, and he'll act surprised that I was home at 5.30 in the morning or 3.30 in the morning, whatever time. And, uh, and then in his uh, drunkenness, he'll express his great love for me, <laughs> which doesn't include letting me sleep through the night. But in fairness, what, is, what does day and night mean to a blind person, right? The wonderful blessing that I had on Friday night was, first of all, God gave me great grace in the moment for David. I didn't feel angry with him, though I should have perhaps. And in between the calls, I had this wonderful, luscious dream that I was opening mail at check from some elderly gentleman for $57 million. <laughs> you see, Christ is risen. <laughs> he's risen for Shaw Islanders. He's risen for David. It's been a time of blessing at Night Watch. In, uh, in February... We had five of our regulars get into apartments in a new building in Seattle, a new uh, low-income building. Um, and suddenly, for these five, everything changed. For years, some of them had been coming every night to Night Watch, uncertain about whether they were going to get a bed, not knowing what food they were going to have, um, they were no longer concerned about their survival needs. Overnight, things changed for them. They, they, they had security, they had safety, and their, their needs shifted in, in, a, in a moment. They knew that they could sleep in, in their own bed. Of course, David doesn't have their phone number. Um, but everything changed. They weren't worried about having to sleep outside. They weren't worried about where their next meal was going to come from. I have this wonderful picture of uh, one of the five we took, because uh, immediately, instead of wondering about where their next meal was coming from, they were asking Nightwatch for help with getting bath mats and uh, shower curtains and microwave ovens, see your, your needs shift. So we amazingly were able to provide these things and I have this photograph of one of the fellows with his new microwave oven and his smile on his face and next to him, his four-year-old grandson also smiling. Oh, see, grandpa's inside, he can provide childcare, the daughter can go back to work during the day. The blessing just kind of keeps rolling in, into the community. Everything changed. Everything changed. And everything changed for, for these two Marys. 
that we find in Matthew 28, the passage I'm going to preach from today. They were going, we're told by Matthew, to look at the tomb. I, I wonder what they were thinking and feeling as they walked along together. The, the, the excitement of Palm Sunday, the heartbreak, the defeat, the, the, the scattering of the flock that happened on, on Good Friday, their friend, dead, his voice, silent. They were shocked, as any of us would be, at a time of grief and, and loss. They walked along together to look at the tomb. And they got there, and here's an angel. And everything is different. The glory of God's revealed. Christ is risen. And here's this angel. What do you think about this passage? You know, I'm a little bit leery of angels, you know. On the one hand, I, I don't want to be too interested in them, right? I, I, I don't want to not believe in them, but I don't want to be too interested in them. There's kind of a danger on both sides, it seems to me. We can let the angels get in the way of the message, and that's all they are, is they're messengers, they're praying a message from God. One commentator likened angels to UPS delivery men. Isn't that a funny image? Do you, you have those up on Shaw? They get up here once in a while. The UPS driver doesn't try to sell you anything. He's not going to be your best buddy. He's focused on his job. He's there to deliver something. That's kind of what we see in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, is and always preceded by these words, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zechariah, your wife is going to have a baby named him John. Gone. Don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid, Joseph. Don't be afraid, shepherds. And then the message follows. Don't be afraid, two Marys on your way to the tomb, at the tomb. Don't be afraid, this UPS driver says to them. Don't be afraid, you are looking for Jesus. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. This was a shock. They were in grief, but it was something Jesus had warned them about. You go back to Matthew 16 and read the passage. Matthew 16, Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And Peter gives this terrific answer. You're the Christ, the Holy One, the Anointed One. And the very next verses... Jesus begins from that moment to tell them what was going to happen, that he was going to be delivered up and crucified and on the third day raised from the dead. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. Got to read chapter 16 to understand verse, chapter 28 in Matthew. Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Don't be afraid. There's so much to be afraid. But none of that stuff matters anymore. Jesus is alive. Fear is banished. So then, are we going to let an earthquake, a violent earthquake, make us afraid? I love the word in the Greek. It's seismos. Do you recognize that word? We have a seismic, a mighty seismos. And I think of the words of Psalm 46. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way. The Lord Almighty is with us. The angel is simply God's messenger, powerful on our behalf, powerful on behalf of these women. His appearance is like lightning. He's able to roll the stone away. And then I like that he just sits on it, you know. <laughs> Almost casually. In fact, he rolls the stone away, and he's still, his clothing are still glowing white. When I do stuff in the yard, I am not glowing white. And that stone was rolled away. Why? To let Jesus out? No. It's to reveal the empty tomb to the women. Don't be afraid, the angel says. Not a command. It's a word of comfort. There's no 
Such comfort for those tough Roman guards, though. What happens to them? It says they're shaking and as though they were dead men. They swooned. They were fainted. They were so afraid. I was going to say they swooned like little girls, but that would be an insult to little girls who are some of the toughest people I know. They swooned, let's say, like Roman guards always do when confronted by resurrection power. Don't be afraid, for I know you are seeking Jesus who is crucified. Jesus is alive. Fear is banned. So think about this. They're in a graveyard. They're at the tomb of a friend. They're confronted by this angelic being who invites them to look. Why? Because of the eyewitnesses that were necessary. Do you get that? Because they needed eyewitnesses. And so the women looked in. Now, a graveyard is a place I don't, I mean, I'm okay. I have to go to graveyards because I'm a minister. But these places can be not the nicest places to be because we don't like thinking about our own demise. We don't like being confronted with mortality and loss and grief. And, and so we, we realize that, that death is the enemy of human community. Right, That death is ultimately dying itself. And in Christ's resurrection, the end of death is proclaimed. Its doom is sure. Death itself will be done away with the end of all things. Death is the consequence of sin. Death fractures the human community. It is not unreasonable to be afraid at this moment. But Jesus is alive. The terror of death is broken. This is so important. I, I wish I could introduce you to my friend Giant. Giant is, he's giant. He's six foot four, 350 pounds. That's just my real, my guess. He's big. I mean, he would stand out in a crowd under, under the, normal circumstances anywhere he goes. But he also is afflicted with a genetic disease called basal cell nevis syndrome, which means that he has a, a genetic problem that makes him subject to cancer. His whole life he's had cancer. He's had like 1,500 surgeries. He tells me that all of the skin on his face has been replaced except for his eyelids. I mean, he has whole parts of his face that are missing, parts of his nose. I mean, he's a horror to look at. One of the most wonderful guys. But he's had a horrible, painful, painful life. He has a golf ball-sized tumor in his brain for which they can do nothing. Nothing can be done. It's just waiting now. He's waiting for his own personal Golgotha and refusing pain pills and going to power through with God's help. And I asked him this week, what do you think about Jesus' suffering, giant? You've been homeless for most of your adult life. He's had Mothers on the bus tell him he shouldn't go out because he's scaring the children. He's had people scream and run away from him because of his looks. What do you think about Jesus' suffering? And this was what he said. He said, Jesus suffered for us, but he was blameless. What does it mean to somebody like Giant that that tomb was empty? His suffering is meaningful because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. I've been taking a class uh, this quarter 
taught by a uh, Seattle Pacific uh, New Testament scholar named Rob Wall. Uh, it's on the book of Revelation, <laughs> which I have to confess is not my favorite book of the Bible to study. In fact, uh, I would maybe have run away from such a study because I've, in my ministry time, have had lots of fringe people who wanted to do too much with that book or do other things with it than what the writer intended and what God intended. And, um, but Dr. Wall has changed my mind. The, the way that the, the class is arranged is he lectures for an hour on the book and then uh, community members like me, we all seem to be seniors, um, go with the students into another room and there's about 100 of us and we sit in small groups and we listen again to the Bible passage that it was lectured on and maybe they'll read it to us two or three times and then, uh, and then, uh, and then we'll talk around the table. Well, the, this last session, uh, we were sitting there and they, were, they read the passage and then they wanted to play a song for us that related to the passage. This is Revelation 4, and you have these great doxologies. Uh, worthy, uh, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and power and strength. You know, in that song, thou art worthy, thou art worthy. And so they had the music ready to go, but there was some problem with the sound system. And they, they, we had squawking and, and then muffled sounds and then more squawking and more muffled sounds. And meanwhile, our contemplative, you know, and the, and the, and the, was broken, you know. Our, our, our attempts at sort of uh, being inspired by this music was just, the moment was lost. And we were all sitting there kind of feeling grumpy. And, you know, have you had that experience ever, you know? So uh, one of the girls at the table uh, said, I could play it on the piano. And somebody want to sing with me? And so there were a couple of young co-eds up there playing the piano and singing the song. And they started off badly too, which didn't help. But then as they sang, and as the rest of us joined in, the Spirit was present. The Holy Spirit was there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and who is to come. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. And then the words of the lecture broke in and we, learned, we had learned that this accolade that's in the middle of chapter 4 of the book of Revelation is stolen directly from praise to the Caesar. Praise to the Roman authority turned upside down and applied to God. The Lord God Almighty. Do you understand? Not subject to the rule of empire. The 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 seal on that rock outside that tomb. You know, as a kid, I guess I always thought about my dad's caulking gun. You know, when it talked about the seal on the tomb, right? That it was sealed up, somehow physically sealed up. No, this was an edict, a Rome saying, don't mess with this place. The, the resurrection was against the law. Because there's no law, there's no human power on earth that can control the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection power that was expressed on that first day and symbolized by that broken seal, that seal that's set aside because there's a higher law, a higher power. The power of empire The resurrection was an act of civil disobedience and the ineffectualness of empire was seen in those poor guards. 
right? Totally useless. Got to read the rest of chapter 28 to find out what happens to them. Totally useless. The resurrection puts human empire on notice. No human power can overcome resurrection power. And that reaches to the far corners of the entire creation. It's not just for us. It's not just for Seattleites or Shaites, but it reaches into the very corners of society and place. That power that cannot be stopped. We all enjoyed in Seattle, uh, you know, our superiority and our power in the football field this year, right? And the the week, uh, the week that uh, we enjoyed this grand uh, championship, then we had this wonderful uh, civic celebration, and they said 750,000 people in downtown Seattle, something like that. I wasn't there, so maybe it was one less than that, because that seems like higher than the total population of the city. But that week, I was out on the street with a, a new street minister, and I needed to show him this place. And I, I, I wrote this little uh, essay called The Hole in the Fence. There's a hole in the fence in my town it looks too small for a person to crawl through, but we do, pushing hard to get through like oversized babies. When we go through that hole in the fence, we enter into a world of despair. Last night at midnight, we pressed corpulent flesh through that hole and entered into a dark world under a highway. Homeless people sleep here, wrapped in cardboard, plastic, and blankets, a community of sorrow and regret. They clump together for safety more than warmth. Our blankets were received with thanksgiving and amazement. It was 26 degrees. My friend and I were quiet as we left this place until we squeezed back through the hole in the fence. What was there to say? This is the world we live in where 750,000 people cram the streets to celebrate civic pride, but not a single one knows about the hole in the fence. The gospel and the power of the resurrection extends even to those people living on the other side of that hole, that gospel power, that resurrection power that's at work within us. I think about sometimes the, the danger that people assume I, I, I deal with in my work I actually, I think, you know, more ministers uh, suffer more at the hands of committee work than I ever have at the, uh, uh, in a bar or underneath I-5 in the middle of the night. So the danger is relative, but um, I, I go into a bar or a shelter underneath I-5, and I know that the Holy Spirit is there. The power of the resurrection is already there. And sometimes that person in the bar or underneath I-5 has already experienced a movement of the Holy Spirit before I got there, prodding them, convicting them, encouraging them sometimes. And all I'm doing is simply being faithful. And safety isn't always safe, right? Right? Sometimes I'm tempted to stay home on a Thursday night, which is my night out late. I'm tempted to stay home on a Thursday night thinking I'm tired, I'm weary, or I just don't feel like it. And I think the lost opportunities maybe have more of a danger to I stay home. It may feel safe to stay home, but it's not, it's not. Running away from your calling, you know, we have a, testimony to that, the book of Jonah. You may end up in the belly of a whale. So here we are. Here we are at the, uh, at the tomb, the empty tomb. I read this morning uh, in my personal devotions from Psalm 42, and I wondered about why I needed to tell you about blind David. 
you know, seven late night phone calls. And then I was reading in Isaiah 42, and I read these words, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths I will guide them. I will turn darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Because of the resurrection, nothing will ever be the same again for any of us. Nothing will ever be the same for David. And now maybe you're not sure. Maybe you're walking in your own blindness, your own spiritual uncertainty, your own doubts, and that's fine. But my question for you is, are you willing to at least open the door a crack? Are you willing to allow for the possibility that the eyewitnesses told the truth? That's all you need. Open the door of your heart a crack, and he'll come in. Let's pray. For your glorious resurrection, keep us from spiritual blindness and hardness of heart. Help us to be forgiving and gracious toward people that we disagree with, toward people that are difficult to love. We acknowledge, Lord, that oftentimes we're the ones that are difficult to love. And Lord, whether it's under a freeway, in a bar, or in the quietness of, of a living room, we're thankful that you come in to our hearts, into our minds, and that you love us. And thank you, Lord, for those loving, generous witnesses who saw with their own eyes. In Jesus' name.